once I had it on the system and I, I had the desire to be a race car driver, all I aimed was for Formula One, to be amongst the best drivers in the world. That was, that was the aim. So I took the challenge. It was not easy. It's never easy. I had to leave my country at the age of 16, moved into F1 in 15, drove for Sauber for two years. It, it all happened real quick, to be honest. Luckily, you know, I've been very rarely involved into crashing. I think you create with time and experience, you know how to manage those risks. Even when you're winning is how you stay at the top, how you're able to find more within yourself. Felipe Nasser, Formula One racing car driver from Brazil. We speak all things racing from Formula Three to Formula One, and now what he's doing is racing for Porsche. We speak about the mindset, training, and the business behind what he does. Be happy, never content, and thank you very much for your time. Right, welcome back to my podcast, The Stephen Sully Study. I've got a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guest and an athlete, a winner, in front of me today. For <laughs> Felipe Nasa, uh, all the way from Brazil, back to Soho in London. Thank you very much for your time and welcome on the podcast. Thank you, Stephen. It's my pleasure to be here and I'm sure we're going to share some interesting stories and you know get to know a little more all the path from racing and you know everything that goes uh, together with that path so uh i'm really glad to be here thank you man good good man uh before we start um i've got to congratulate you because i know we're sort of jumping ahead uh talking about what you're doing right now but then we're going to go back to the right to the start i know you're racing and driving for porsche and i've got here from a news article i'll read it uh out to you Newsroom on the 2nd of the 10th, 2022, so only you know, a week or so ago, Porsche wins all GTD Pro titles with, is it P Pataf Motorsports? Uh, Pataf Motorsports, yeah. Okay, cool. Canadian, Canadian so, team. So tell me yeah, a bit more about more. that. Yeah, and, and you, you were a part of that, right? Yes, yes. So what happened was, uh, so Pataf uh, Motorsports, they are a Canadian team. Uh, which they participate in the IMSA championship, and that's the championship we took part in. And uh, the regular drivers were uh, Matthew Jaminet, which is a French driver, and uh, Matt Campbell from Australia. And myself, uh, I was doing all the endurance events, which we have four uh, during the calendar. And I was, you know, I was uh, taking part of, of, of those races. So Daytona Sebring, and Petit Le Mans, which is Road Atlanta, we raced it last week. Uh, so we won Daytona, which was the first race of the year, and my first ever race for Porsche. So that was a pretty good, um, you know, uh, welcome, uh, you know, to, to the team and to the brand. And uh, as well, you know, we got uh, we got the title for IMSA champions. So as drivers, teams, and manufacturer, so a pretty good, uh, pretty good year. And uh, it was it was my first Daytona win as well, which was something I always uh, had it on the list. But always, uh, you know, we came close a couple of times, a few second places, third places, but never won Daytona. I've had previously won the IMSA championship twice in 18 and 21. So, uh, you know, getting one more for the team and for Porsche was 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 pretty awesome. Congratulations, man. Uh, well, Thanks, well, well, well deserved. Um, Right. Before we talk about, you know, going from karting to Formula BMW, Formula 3, GP2 series, Formula 1, etc. I want to just ask you about, like, how you got involved with racing. Because I'll tell you why I asked this. <laughs> I'm from a, what I would call, quote unquote, quite a normal background. I, my family are not rich and they're not poor. We're just kind of middle class. And I don't think I can recall many kids or many people in my school turning around to me or, or the school teachers saying I want to become a Formula One driver for example part of the reason being is because it's always been perceived as you kind of can't get into it unless you've got funding behind you for example football in London and across the UK is very very popular part of the reason why it's so popular is so it's, it's, it's fairly accessible. I could walk around Soho, I could go to Hyde Park, I could go to any park, and there are people playing football and they're practicing. But you can't really practice Formula One driving just go by going down to the park. So is there, um, have I got a bit of a naive brain that you can't really get into 
racing car driver unless you've got a bit of funding behind you? Yeah, I think you're touching a pretty important uh, topic there, uh, Steve, because uh, motor racing in general, it's expensive. You know, buying a tire or uh, fuel and tires and racetrack, renting racetracks is already, you know, you can name it all. It's it's already a pretty high bill on the list, right? Yeah. Um, so it felt, it felt a little impossible when I started, but uh, luckily I was born into a family that was already involved in motor racing. Uh, so my father, together with his uh, middle brother, uh, they, they had the virus before I did. So they were into karting before that. My father was the engine builder and mechanic at the same time. My uncle was the driver. And, you know, with the little money they make, they tried to do a few races in, in the UK. If you recall, Formula Ford was what they tried at the time. Mm. They didn't go too far, so they came back to Brazil again and uh, they started their own race team. And, and they, they were involved into different classes like uh, stock car racing, Formula 3 racing, uh, prototype racing, uh, single seaters from all different junior categories. And... You know they were they were just servicing as a team right mm. and then uh and that's when i came about when i was seven years old i, I was I, I i i always enjoyed going to the races with them and watching closely you know how the mechanics work and all the the whole team as a as a as a whole right like uh every, every position for me was pretty interesting at the time as a kid uh but i never thought for myself I was going to be a race driver one day until I tried a go-kart for the first time when I was seven. Uh, and I recall being so different to any other sport and any other thing that I've done at that age, right? Like playing football or playing video games or any other sports or anything that I tried then tennis or it was so different. And at the same time was so natural for me. And uh, I, I have to say, you know, being born with a little bit of that gift uh, gave me the, um, let's say, gave me the, the courage and the pursuit to, to, to go and find that, you know, where, where, how far can I get? And, uh, uh, but like you said, then it came to the topic, like, is this something you really want to do? I was never forced by my family. I was never obliged to be a race car driver. It was something that came naturally from myself. And, uh, in fact, my parents were very restrict in, in, in the times like being at school and having my, uh, my stuff done as any other kid as my age. So I didn't lose my, uh, let's say my, uh, my knowledge as a kid or my, uh, I was living as a kid, right? I, I, mm. seven, seven to eight years old, all, all, you know, it's take one day, each, you know, one day at a, at a time. And, uh, I was doing a few go-kart uh, uh, practice sessions every now and then. And then I told my father I really wanted to, to do that. And he said, well, so here's your mechanic number. You're going to call him whenever you want to go test. And it's up to you. If you feel it's something you want to you, you go, you're going to go beyond. It's down to you. And also, all, you know, I, I have to say back then, my family luckily had the backing that I could do these early steps into go-karts. Uh, obviously, you know, it's, it's a big investment for, uh, we are saying karting nowadays already different to the, to the times that when I, when I started racing has already gone up, maybe double what you spend today to, to begin a career. So, uh, different to football or playing tennis and so on. The early stages are always, I would say a little bit easier to get into it, uh, compared to motor racing, but uh, it worked out and, uh, you know, from, from, from sponsors and families we were able to get, get, get together, uh, that truly believed in my career. Uh, I was able to have, uh, let's say a healthy, uh, go karting career, uh, being able to win, uh, different titles here and so on, uh, Brazilian championships. And that made me, uh, move on to the next step. But funding is a big topic in racing. Yeah, because um, a bit of insight to my life, I am. I don't know if Pietro mentioned this to you, but I'm a boxer. I fight, and I've had. You're six, a boxer. Yeah, yeah. I've had sixteen fights, and I had my last fight back in March. 
Now, Felipe, when I was going to learn as a 14-year-old, when I first went into the boxing gym, mm-hmm. do you know how much it cost me a session? 50p. 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 Just, yeah, yeah to, because it was, um, yeah. it was uh, partly run by the local authority, the council in Bromley, Brom- Bromley and Downham. And what it meant is <clears throat> any kid from any walk of life any gender, any race, they could just go into a boxing gym and most people could afford 50p and, and then they could learn and get fit and be a part of this community. And it's very, very similar to, to the football, as I mentioned earlier. You could go to any park or any, any kind of estate and see you know, a crowd of young men or young females or a mix kicking a ball up against a wall. But the reality is, you know, you can't really just go down to a park or go into a club and just start racing. So, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that, that, that kind of psychological barrier that some people may have when they're thinking about pursuing race car driving, but then they are held back slightly because of the funding. And the only one I kind of uh, have researched that might have broken that mold was Lewis, right? I mean, he, he didn't come really from a, a wealthy, wealthy background, but... He's become a phenomenal superstar. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, his. Um, I mean, for sure, someone had to uh, believe and invest on in his career, right? Which is normally the case with uh, most drivers that can find a way or a path to uh, to get the funding done. And uh, uh, you, you you touched on a topic. Lewis, you know, is a great example. He was involved on a junior program very early on when he was still go-karting and uh, that took him all the way where he is now, right? But there was, uh, uh, again, trust from a company and a manufacturer and a team that is very well uh, known, you know, and uh, they, they, they took the opportunity. And I've seen to many other drivers uh, like myself when I was at the age of 16 as well, um, my family didn't have the backing to 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 move on to the next uh, chapter, right? Which karting was the maximum they could afford, and stepping into a junior uh, single seater was out of reach for us. So, um, luckily, I had a uh, um, you know now he, well he became a friend of mine, but he was a investor at the time in my career, which was uh, Steve Robertson at the age of sixteen. Uh, he was the guy that really uh, believed on my early stages of racing, and he he we did an agreement then, and he was the funding of my career at the age of 16. So that's when I moved to the UK, and I did uh, British F3 at the time. Uh, but if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have made the step, uh, not at all. Mm. And uh, so this is the really hard part of racing, like I said example of Lewis or junior programs related to manufacturers nowadays are, um, let's say, extremely hard to get in. But if, if you're good enough and they, and they find a path that it, they can trust you and you, you prove that you are capable of, of, of the work, there is still plenty of opportunities out there uh, to become a race car driver. And not only in, in Formula One, like I said, uh, being not being, involved to Porsche now that I've been signed to the factory program since the end of 21. I can tell you they do an amazing work with junior drivers at the age of 15, 16 years old, um, where they really look for people, for talented drivers. That's all they want to look for. And they come from families that have no background whatsoever of racing, but they give them a chance to be um, a Porsche factory driver. Mm. And uh, but 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 like you said, we we're talking very specific racing. I think it's very different to other sports in that sense, because uh, without the backing, you don't you don't go to the next step at all. You know, even karting can be a shortage. Uh, you know, maybe you you know you have the uh, the funding to do a couple of tests and race here and there, but to move on to the next step, uh, it's something that has to be planned. It's something that has to be uh well um let's say um collaborated between uh, if it's investors or manufacturers or junior programs that you might be looking for um 
I got introduced to you very, very briefly. I think I remember in a in a club in Mayfair with Pietro, and uh, yeah. it was it was it was the London know, days. Yeah, London days, early <laughs> hours in the morning, and uh, it was all a bit, you know. Oh, I love fro- London. Fro- fro- my frosty memory probably had a bit too much to drink, but anyway, <laughs> I knew you at the time yeah, as, I- a, as a <laughs> as a as uh, a Formula One driver. Okay, and being a kid at seven years of age karting between the years of 2000 and 2007 was it always your mission was it always your goal Felipe to become a Formula One driver it was once I once I had it on the system and I I had the desire to be a race car driver all I aimed was for Formula One was reaching there and uh, being at the pinnacle of motorsports uh, you know the, the the main series that we have in the globe and to be amongst the best drivers in the world, that was that was the aim. And uh, Brazil, we Brazilians have a big history in Formula One. Uh, I'm always been a big Senna fan, and uh, you know from you know from the early days of my career was something I always looked up to. And uh, with many other drivers amongst uh, you know Ayrton, it was always something that we uh, we had as a passion, we Brazilians. But for me, the aim was to be there. And um, so I took the challenge, you know, it was, it was, it was not easy. Uh, it's never easy. So I had to leave my country at the age of 16. Like I said, moved to, I moved to Italy the first year when I won the, 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 the Formula BMW European Championship in 2009. Then I moved on to the British F3 um, ch- Championship in 2010 and 11. I won the 11 Championship. Uh, which then moved me on into Formula 2. Uh, finished third in my last season of GP2, which at the same time I was a, a Williams test driver then and moved into F1 in 15 and 16. Drove for Sauber for two years. And uh, it, it all happened real quick, to be honest. Mm-hmm. You know, from from winning one, one go-karting to Formula BMW and, and then everything happened very quickly. And uh, I saw myself being away from my family for so long. And uh, there are things that we really have to, uh, let's say, sacrifice to make that uh, dream possible, you know. And uh, I'm very glad it all worked out uh, the way we planned. Uh, not, not always the plan, but it, we, we did find a way to get there. Yeah, you you mentioned the word sacrifice. I was about to mention the same word to you because I think anyone at any level in any sport, there has to be an element of sacrifice. Uh, you mentioned yeah. about moving away. That's obviously very, very hard when you're close to your family. But then there's other stuff like what you eat, how you train, the rest, etc. Like there'll be friends of yours probably that will want to go out to a club or want to have a late night or chase girls or whatever it may be. And you need to be disciplined and focused. Um, yeah. Talk to me about the fitness side of things, Felipe, because there sure. are, look, there are certain people that know if you're an MMA fighter, like Aldo, yeah, uh, yes. he's a good grappler, good striker. If you're a, a boxer, Floyd Mayweather, Mike Tyson, you've got to be powerful. But some people are a little bit naive to motorsport. They say, well, you're just sitting down in a seat and you're just going around a circuit. Like yeah. what type of strength and, and fitness yeah. do you need to be that F1 athlete? Well, it's so different to, uh, let's say, when you drive a, a road car, uh, you know, you, you, barely, it's, you barely make any effort, right? So mm. the meaning is driving a race car makes you... I mean, I wish I could take someone on, you know, on board a race car that you could feel all the G forces and the heat inside the cockpit, uh, the the pedals, the brake pedal is is stiff as hell, and uh, you know you have all those vibrations going through your body, and there's so much going on, you know, your uh, your focus, your uh, uh, everything that you're paying attention to, the feeling of the tires, the feeling of the car. And you're going through bumps. You're going through, uh, like I said, acceleration, G forces, uh, and that remains for two hours, sometimes more, right? Mm. So you get yourself exhausted at the end. Sometimes you lose over three to four kilos of liquid uh, uh, after a race. You know, especially in the endurance races that I've been doing uh, recently, 
uh, let's say 24 hours of racing, 24 hours of Daytona. We do in three drivers, sometimes four, but every two hours you drive in the car and uh, uh, people don't realize this is such a sport that physically is very demanding. You know, they have no idea on that. So coming back to the early days, uh, when, I, when I moved to, to, to the UK at the age of 16 to 17, uh when i had uh then signed this deal with uh with this manager and uh he was all about getting myself prepared to the next steps which was really nice something i never had before so uh how to train uh your your nutrition uh things that go in your uh, communication as far as you do with your team everything plays a role you know and i could tell uh it's something we are always learning. We are always developing. And, uh, um, you know, like we said, sacrifice, you know, I could, I could not only go every weekend and, you know, have fun with my friends and so on. These are things that stay behind. These are not priority, you know, uh, but surely I like a balance, you know, we all need a balance as human beings. So, uh, doesn't make sense if I'm all, week long, you know, closed in into my apartment and not seeing anybody or no one, not making friends that, that will have an influence on my performance as well. Right. Of course. So it, it's finding that balance between, uh, how much you looking after yourself and how much you giving some pleasure to yourself in terms of, uh, what are you seeing? Where are you going from? Are you, uh, you know who you who you're going out with uh, the people who are who you are with and with so much in mind I can tell like when at the age of 16 I had no idea of that right yeah now at the age of 30 I have I know exactly what I need to perform and I know exactly if I'm doing too little or too or too much you know depending if it's training or if I'm being uh let's say i'm being lazy for a week or I, I i have all those trigger points already on myself to know if i want to perform that's what it takes you know and i've uh, let's say uh when i have a full week here at home in brazil which is which is which is home for for me now in the last 2 years i have a i have a full training schedule over the week you know, maybe three times a week I'm doing functional training or uh, some some weights combined with, uh, you know, some long runs or short runs of aerobic on the roads or uh, if it's on the bike or if it's swimming or uh, even the recovery side is mega important. Together with that, I do some, uh, I, I have a coach that has been with me for seven to eight years now. Uh, is a mindfulness coach and uh, I've been a lot into meditation, a lot into breathing exercises, uh, relaxation exercises, uh, because there's no, like I said, it's a balance between all components of your body and your personal life. And I can just not train myself and have, you know, mega muscles and be looking fit. And I jump in the car and my mind is nowhere. Right. Yeah. So, um, like I said, I didn't know all about of it when I was 16 years of age, but at 30, I can tell you, I know exactly how to perform. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take you back to when you was a kid again, but also from my perspective, okay? If you're looking at a sport that you really want to get into and dominate, you typically look at the people that are thriving, thriving the world champions, the yeah. people are making yeah. the most amount of money the profile, the social media profile. I mean, for example, Ronaldo or Messi. Ronaldo. These are the people that we look at as soccer Big stars of, yeah, or, or footballers, okay? Then if I'm looking at MMA, I might look at someone like Conor McGregor. If I'm looking at boxing, I might look at Anthony Joshua or Floyd Mayweather, something like that. And if I am a young man now, I, I've just looked at recently some of the champions in Formula One in history, you got Fernando Alonso. Uh, I think he made that return in 2021 back to Alpine, Alpine. Yes. Alpine, yeah. He's got a net worth, according to this, 220 million. Then you got Lewis Hamilton, uh, ha ha Hamilton, uh, 280 million net worth, seven time world champion. And you got Michael Schumacher. According to this publication, he's, he's worth 780 million. And all of that stuff looks really, really good, very exciting. But what they don't, 
reference in this in these publications is actually some of the threat that F1 or racing car drivers go through, which is the obvious crashes. Okay, there's plenty of examples such as Senna. You know, when he crashed, I think it was 1994, which was a, a fatal crash. And there's, I think even there was one recently in 2020 in Bahrain. Am I right? That was a very very bad crash and. Um, you know, people can get seriously injured, or if they don't get injured physically, it's the mental side of it. Mental side, absolutely. When you're when you're a young man, Felipe, maybe not so much when you were young because you're very ambitious and you're fear, fearless and 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 you're hungry to make an impression on the sport. But now you're older, thirty years of age, got a family around you, got friends, and and you know you're seeing the realities of what the sport can actually do. Does, does that ever cross your mind about crashing and? fatalities and stuff well it it's funny because when i'm it's it's not an it's funny or not because at the same time I, when i jump in a race car uh i i don't think about the the uh let's say the uh, uh you know I, I don't think about the limitations itself and having a crash and so on but it suddenly happens right and we all vulnerable to that right but uh, like I said, it's it's all about uh, it's all about the uh, it's a combination of mental and body and so uh, there's all connected at how you how you jump in a race car and you accept those facts. You know, it's it is a dangerous sport. It is something that I do for a living and I know the risks I'm taking. But when I'm driving, man, all I want to do is to perform and I want to do it at my best. So if I'm thinking about those limitations, I'm not going to get there, right? So uh, you just know, you just know you're going for it. And that's, and that's what I do. I know if it was maybe 30, 40 years ago, uh, a race car driving, uh, you know, he, he might not be finishing the race and not might be there to see their team, right? Because the the safety of the tracks, the cars, everything else has improved massively, and and they can continue to do so. So that took away uh, a little bit of that. Um, if maybe maybe you get the point where I'm going. Uh, you say racing in the 70s or the 80s was completely different to the racing mentality now on what we live, right? Because the risk was so much higher of losing a friend or a, a race car driver on track because of the safety uh, that was still being developed in the, in the type of, of the racetracks and so on. So the way you, you, you visualize yourself then getting into a race car, I feel it's different to today. But like I said, if I'm not jumping in a, in a car and knowing that I can take the car to the limit, I, I, I want to perform, then I don't have to be thinking about those limitations. And that goes for simple things, right? Like when I say um, all the ingredients that goes before you jump in a race car. So what you've been eating, what you've been listening to, who you've been talking to, what are your mindsets lately? What are your thoughts lately? Uh, you know, what have you been suffering for or what have you been happy with? Uh, this all makes an influence on how you're going to perform, you know, and how to be in that zone or we call it the flow or we call it, uh, you know, I like to call it the, the flow or the zone, you know, when I'm really there present at the, at the moment and I know I'm going to get the best out of myself. Yeah. Because a, a bit like boxing, there must be a paradox between going for something and pushing yourself, but not doing too much in case you do something crazy and, and crash or hurt yourself. For example, I could be in a boxing fight, get beaten up, but I'm weathering the shots and I'm blocking the shots. And I know if I go forward a bit too much, I might be, expose myself and get hurt and get maybe brain damage or get knocked out. But if I don't go forward and don't press on, I may not hit, be able to connect with them and win the fight. And as a racing car driver, there's sometimes probably moments where you look at a corner or look at, look at overtaking someone or whatever else. But you know that if you're going to pull off that maneuver, it could put, probably put your life in danger. Do you, ever, do you ever come across that paradox thinking? Well, I, I've never really been into that position. Like I've, I've, luckily, you know, I've been very rarely involved into crashing, but that's because 
I think you create with time and experience, uh, you know how to manage those risks. You know, like, I'm not going to put the car in here in this corner at this speed and this angle because this overtaking is not going to work, right? And that's when you see most of the cases of big accidents or crashes is because something didn't play right or something wasn't, uh, you know, was well calculated at, at that time, right? And there are times that are, uh, uh you know uh, mistakes that happen that are out of control or f- human control if, if it's a failure if it's a, a tire that blows or uh, we don't have control of those things but those uh, that you can see the good race drivers do it is that they know how to manage the risk and reward between those moves yeah because senna I've watched his documentary. It's fantastic. Um, and what an incredible champion. I think he was three-time world champion. Is that right? Yes, right. Um, but he seemed to be a bit fearless, but at the same time, a bit kamikaze-like. He was almost like he would go for the crash in order to wipe out somebody else. So over the season, he would he would win. Like, it, it just seemed a bit mental. Yes, yeah, I think Ariton was very particular in the way he, he I mean, he, uh, let's say his driving style, his attitude over racing. And uh, you knew if, like, let's say you, you knew in your mirrors if Senna was coming, if you leave the door open, he wouldn't leave a chance, right? And I think he imposed that to the driver. So everybody knew that. Um but sometimes it didn't play well for him as well, right? Mm. Because, uh, you know, th- there were cases that he will find himself out of a race contention just by, you know, some accident like that. But, hey, that's what made Senna what it's Senna like. Mm. And uh, we we'll always remember him by his aggressive, but at the same time driving the car the way it should be driven, the way it should be performed, Right. And uh, and that's what I look as a race car driver. I know how to – there are times we have to know when to be aggressive or when to be conservative. I cannot always go full win because I have the experience and the knowledge and to balance out this probability of things going right or wrong, right? Mm. Uh, where, whereas you have drivers that are fully – they have their speed, they have their aggression, but they don't know how to manage that. Mm. So they're always going to do a one great race. And then after three races, they are crashing into, into all the cars or they're making mistakes all the time. So uh, it's not about the speed and aggression. You need to find a balance in between all of those. I, I guess I like other athletes as well, uh, like uh, boxing, football, etc. If you do something crazy, it's kind of on you. But with Formula One or many other, you know, racing car sports, you've got the car itself, you've got the team behind it. And if you wipe out that car, you're costing, I mean, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, you know, and it's it's a lot of, it's a big risk. You know, if you if you take a risk, it's not just a risk on your own life, but the business side of it as well. Yeah, there's a lot of things behind, like you said, the cost of all uh, you know, the equipment, you know, putting another race driver in danger or uh, there's so much that goes in, in your mind that uh, in the end we are responsible. Like I said, you are behind the wheel and you have to calculate those those moves, right? Yeah. If you go for it and you got to know, uh, you cannot be a 50-50 driver, 50% of doing great stuff and 50% of doing shit stuff. Yeah. Like you have you have to find a balance where you know if you're committing to a move, uh, it's going to be sensible. It's going to be, um, it's going to play in, in your favor, right? Yeah. Um, Gumball Rally. You've heard of the Gumball Rally? Rally? Yeah. The Gumball Rally. Rally. Yeah. Gumball 3000. No? Number 3000. The Gumball 3000. Ah, yes. I've heard about where they take all the sports cars on the road or something like that. That's it. So you you yeah. basically the reason why it's called Gumball Three Thousand is mm-hmm. you're approximately meant to cover three thousand miles, and you yes. go from one destination to another. You normally hit about five or six different destinations. Well, I just I done it in uh, May through to uh, How that? Did you amazing. Did you that? Was amazing. Good? It went from Toronto all the way down to Miami. Okay. Amazing. 
Now, the reason why I mention it is because the second stop was in Indianapolis. Okay, I've never been there in my life. And the Mega. organizer, Maximilian Cooper, the Gumball Rally, they organized us to go to an Indy car uh, race. race. Yes. Yep. And I had a very naive mindset, right? I, I thought, this is a Formula One car, but it's going round and round and round and round. And is it going to be that exciting? Is it going to be that entertaining? I've got to tell you, I'm converted. I love it. There was like 350,000 people at this stadium, something right, crazy. Right. It was really, really hot right. and it was, it was amazing. Now, I've got here, in 2020, you were going to become an Indy, car, uh, Indy 500 car racer, but sadly you caught Corona and you, you never started. Is that right? Well, the thing is, what happened there was uh, in 2020, I had I was still involved on my IMSA program together with Cadillac, and uh, the there was an invitation from uh, an English team to to take part on the IndyCar series, right? Mm. And I did all the te I did two testing with them, and everything was running well. We were one of the quickest on testing, so we said, you know, let's do a couple of races and see uh you know how the, how the season goes and then that's when the pandemic came right right in 2020 and uh that was that all went to to the drain you know like that that was gone the plan with the indycar thing was done and the team as well they uh you know they they, they were not going to take part in the championship anymore due mm. to like i said you know the, the pandemic hit so many people in different ways and businesses so I, I continue my path on the IMSA DPI series, uh, which is what I got uh, two championships out of it in 18 and 2021. But yes, 2020, I was supposed to have a race and then I had COVID uh, just maybe a week or a few days before competition, which was at the time pretty shocking because nobody knew, uh, you know, how it was going to be the recovery, how it's going to affect you as an athlete or to be sidelined and like, is he, is he going to come back strong enough? Or uh, there's so many ifs, right, at that time. But now we know more about, about it. We Now mm -hmm. we we understand more about the complications and how, how to recover from it. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I was doing the uh, Gumball Rally, I went through Alabama and they took us to a NAS car circuit and had uh -huh. the opportunity of doing four laps round the circuit as a passenger. Yeah, oh, in, 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 yeah in, a, in a car. And again, my naive mindset was like, oh, you just go round and round and round. But it's only when you're going 170, 180 miles per hour and you're in that car and you can feel it sliding did I actually realize what skill goes into this. But, okay, Formula One, Monaco, on the streets, going around all of these crazy corners and it's very, very tight, opposed to an Indy, car, Indy 500 race. Like, what is the difference in skill? You know, what's harder? What do you prefer? It's so different, you know. It's uh, it's like talking motorcycles, uh, motocross or MotoGP, for example. You're talking completely different classes. And like I said, F1 racing, I've, I've been there. And uh, I drove uh, two seasons for uh, for a Swiss team, and drove drove at Monaco. Monaco has to be one of the most difficult races, uh, street course racing, street racing uh, that you're ever gonna find. But it's the it's that challenge uh, as a driver, the combination car uh, and track. You know, being so close to the walls, taking risks, and. Uh, Man, it's just unbelievable to um, the, the feeling and the emotions you get in the, inside a race car, in, inside a Formula One car at that place. It's pretty special, right? It's pretty special. And in the in the racing, uh, in the 500, when you see those cars going on a on a oval, just turning left, but there's so much going on. You know, there's so much that the driver has to be aware of. Uh, you know, positioning himself when he's Let's say if he's on traffic and following another car, there's so many ways that dirty air that comes from the car in front can influence his line and how he's going to approach the car, how he's going to set up the car for that. And you have fractions of milliseconds to decide 
what's going to come next, right? Because you're doing over, uh, as you said, you know, over 200 miles. Uh, I think they do an average of 330 kilometers per hour on a, wow. on a 500 lap. So it's crazy. There's the decisions you make and the effort you make to be physically present and handling the car for over three hours and being focused with all the dehydration, all the, uh, you know, your heart rate is going to the roof and how do you, how do you control that? It's, it's, um, it's like incredible. That's what I love about being a race car driver is it's how to manage all those things together and still perform. So the Porsches that you drive now, opposed to all the other sort of type of racing or driving that you've done formula e for example formula one for formula three formula bmw indycar i mean how 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 is the porsche racing different to all of those well the porsche uh, the the project that we have for 2023 will come in play 2023 it's that we are developing um a new prototype, uh, which is called uh, the Porsche 963, which is still undergoing development and testing. And uh, we're doing kilometers and kilometers of testing on it because the cars still have to be homologated in a few weeks. Uh, but the, the car is a, so the car is a prototype, right? So he's made to last many, many hours racing. 24 hours of Daytona, 12 hours of Sebring, 12 hours of Le Mans. This is what the car is made for, is to be capable, to be durable, right? The car has to have, has to be reliable. It's, 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 it's not as, uh, let's say the car is more robust. You know, the car has to be built stronger than comparing to a Formula One car where you have all this um, kind of flexible parts and make the car super lightweight uh because they are they are made for different type of racing where um the endurance racing stuff it's way different the dynamic of racing um first of all because you're sharing the car with three drivers right when you're doing such a long race like those so you're not any you're not only just one individual sharing the car you're having all three drivers driving the same car so how do you compromise the driving setup between you three and how do you cooperate all you three working together because i can only think the car that is good for me might not be good for you right mm. so how do we find a balance between that and the car we're driving and uh but the car has incredible power 700 brake horsepower uh made out of a, of a hybrid component as well so the, this car has a Electric, electrical motor in it as well, together with the combustion engine. And all together, they produce 700 brake horsepower. And uh, they stints, you know, maybe one uh, one full tank on the car maybe can do up to an hour, one hour, 10 flat out. And uh, you do that for 24 hours. You come in, change tires, fuel, and go again. So the cars are made to be reliable and robust to endure such such challenge but they are different they're little different techniques of driving like a formula one car drives differently differently to a prototype racing so uh but i've been having the most fun of my career by far driving prototypes for me is that the racing is better it's more competitive you have everybody has chances of winning it whereas in f1 sometimes can't get you know, it can get really boring because you only see one or two cars winning a race, right? Mm. All season long because they they might not have the best engineers and the best budget to get there. But where we are now, I feel the competition is a lot more fair uh, in terms of giving everybody a chance of, of, of showing and showcasing, um, you know, the capabilities of winning a race. Yeah. I was going to ask you, actually, what... what... What has um, what's like the hardest type of vehicle out of all the ones that you've driven to really perfect and get the best out of? I would say I would put definitely the Formula One car up there, and uh, I would say the prototype as well. Like I said, the the years that I drove for Cadillac, driving the DPI, and now driving for Porsche on the LMDH, uh, high, you know, LMDH car, 
it's a car that is I would those two they are very difficult to master just because there's so much going on you know it's it's the tires the track the wind uh the track evolution uh there's so many components and things you have to be able to feel and filter and make a decision and the driving itself to perform on those cars it's like being on a perfect sink within yourself it's like uh I don't know. We we are part of the race car, you know. When we sit behind the wheel, and we are there on the on the race seat, it's like uh, you, you you are the main sensor. You are the main feedback of the car. Yeah. So to perform at such a level of, uh, yeah, let's say, close to perfection is it, it, it's very challenging, but at the same time, is the pleasure that is given. It's it's amazing. And so going back to my boxing days, when I was 14 years of age, after my second boxing class, they threw me into the ring and said, spar this guy who's you know, years older than me. And I literally got beaten up for like a round or two. And afterwards I asked them, I said, why'd you do that? And they said, we, we want to know whether or not you're going to last uh, in this sport. And the way we figured it out very early is if the kids like to fight whether they're 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 you know they're getting beaten up and they can are they gonna where, give up or they gonna yeah, exactly and my question to you is as a as a not just a formula one driver but a, an all-rounded race car driver are do you is there an element that you have to be addicted to like the speed the thrill the danger are you addicted to to speed basically felipe it's, it's all of it it's a combination of the speed the adrenaline the challenge the uh um you know the the desire of winning if you don't have those components man you can get out of the door you know it's 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 not made of being there just as a as a number right you're there to perform and that's what i do for a living if i wasn't performing i wasn't going to be hired by anyone i wasn't going to be you know overlooked by any sponsor or any manufacturer so uh i think i'm doing it right <laughs> as far as where my career is at right now and i just love what i do i love the challenge i love the speed i love the um the challenge of setting up the uh, setting up the car and understanding the track the tires what's best for the car and talking to the engineers and finding a way a strategy to get better at, uh, at a race and even when you're winning is how you stay at the top you know it's how you how you able to find more within yourself like every day i think about that you know how i'm gonna get better at this i just because i'm winning i'm not gonna sit there and i know all the ingredients you know like i'm always trying to find something within myself and i can tell you i'm always learning i'm always opening to to learning new things because in in the race or in a scenario you can always find yourself somewhere you've never been before mm. and how you react to that mm. or you don't react to that you know it's it's all those readings you have um, that I feel makes you be at the top, right? And how you filter, filter them uh, because there's always stuff around us that we are learning, you know, each, each day, even our personal life, we are learning things day to day. Yeah. So, uh, but like I said, I love what I do. I love the sport that I'm in and I surely want to do it for, for many, many years to come. So, so you're 30 years of age and you're old enough to have the experience and you're young enough to still have plenty of time ahead of you where you're going to hit some massive goals, no doubt, Felipe. So over yeah. the next 5, 10, 15 yeah. years, what are you going to achieve? What are you going to do in this sport of racing, but then beyond, like businesses and stuff? Well, on the racing side, uh, I still want to win the 24s of Le Mans, which is something I don't have yet. I want to win a couple of those. I still want to win a couple of Daytona 24s. Uh, they call the Triple Crown when you win Daytona, Sebring, and Le Mans. There's only a very few drivers that are able to accomplish that. Uh, and then, you know, it, it's, it, it could be a, life, a lifelong uh, term career uh, when you're talking to brands like Porsche, uh, you know, who knows? They've always been involved in racing, so it will be nice to continue the capture with them and continue a, a history with them, uh, you know, on the track and off the track. Uh, 
uh, I'm, you know, I, 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 it's it sounds a bit of cliche, but I'm I'm a fan of the brand as well. And uh, Porsche, if you look at the history, success, you know, they've won they've won all legendary races that you can ever imagine. Mm. And uh, I want to continue riding there for ne- for many many years. But on the business side. I don't know. I want to be involved in racing somehow. Uh, if I can't drive a car, a race car anymore at a certain age, maybe be involved on a on a technical side or be involved as a um, sportive director if, with any other race team or maybe have my own race team. I don't know. And uh, I'm really into uh, off the track. I'm really into uh, fishing stuff. I really like fishing. I saw that. And I, yeah, I, I, I go to the Amazon every every year, every time, once a year I go there. And I have to say, man, it's the one of the most fascinating things I ever see seen in my life in terms of the whole scenario. You know, you're in the, you're in the jungle, you're in the middle of nowhere, and you're fishing some monster stuff. But at the same time, you are disconnected from this world I live in, which is the racing, the responsibility, the pressure. So out there, I'm a different person. I'm just, you know, um, I'm the Felipe I've known as a kid, you know, and and that's why I connect myself with the nature and uh, maybe something related to that, you know, that I can take people there to experience what I'm saying and uh, just have a good time uh, putting together, you know, fishing trips where can people really feel the experience to be somewhere unique, and you know, sit down and you know, have a have a beer or have a barbecue by next to the river, where you see no run, no one in a range of you know thousands of kilometers. You might see no one around you. So uh, this is something I think of as well. Yeah, I only got three more questions to ask you because I know you probably have to go. Is that okay? Go ahead, man. Cool. I got written down here that you love Star Wars and James Bond. Why? Yeah, well, well, I I always did as a kid. Uh, maybe I should redo those questions for myself, you know, because like anything, we change with time as well. And uh, mm. as a kid, I always enjoyed watching Star Wars and all the James Bond movies because all the cool things were there. Uh, but maybe if you ask me now, I'm a lot more into music. I would say uh, I've I've enjoyed playing. I've, I started learning the guitar maybe three four years ago. So I've been very much uh, into music lately. Um, you know, not that I'm gonna be a, a famous artist or anything, but just I like the, um, I like the, I like the vibe. You know, I like the fun. Sometimes we have a couple of friends at home, and someone wants to play a guitar, or you know, we can all stay together here. Uh, and um, and on movies, man, I don't know movies nowadays. What was the, the the latest movie I saw? Maybe Top Gun was the latest one I saw. Unbelievable, unbelievable movie. So so good, you know the, the those uh, those measurements they change from time to time. So it's diff- difficult to say what's my favorite now. Yeah, being an Englishman and obviously Bernie Eccleston developing Formula One, being a billionaire and being a very successful man. What is he like to meet and kind of work under? Well, I had the opportunity to 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 meet uh, Bernie in person a couple of times, and uh, you can tell the guy is a visionary. You know, he knows. Uh, I mean, Formula One only is Formula One down to him for all that he's done to the sport and the teams he put together, the drivers uh, that he believed on, and uh, everything takes time. And I feel. He, he did a tremendous work uh, to get Formula One to what it is now. You know, you, you look at those paychecks that race teams get and race drivers get, sponsors they're able to uh, uh, to, to, to gather. It's, it's pretty uh, amazing, right? Hmm. And uh, But from the times I was able to, to, to meet Bernie, you could tell he was a very, uh, um, you know, like uh, – I don't know. He's very objective on things. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't waste time or too much conversation. Like, because I wonder how many people wanted to meet him and get into business stuff. Like it's black and white, you know, this work, this doesn't work. And, uh, I could see the guy was straight to the point every time I met him. Yeah. Very, very entrepreneurial. Um, this is my last question. So when I first started my, 
brand or my first company when I was 24 years of age, I come up with a mantra. And this is how mantra. it goes. Yeah, like a, a life uh, lesson. It goes yes. like this. Be happy, never content. Now, I've got my own interpretation of that. If I were to ask you, Felipe Nasa, what does <laughs> be happy, never content mean to you? I would just say be here now. That's that's what it takes, you know. If you if you're living the moment fully, and if you're doing what you like, you are surrounded by the people you wanted to be with. Just just fully live the life, you know. Be here now. Be here. The moment is the present moment, and that's what we should be doing. You know, we sometimes make too many too too many plans and desires of things will be perfect at a, you know, in two three years time. This this for me has has very little meaning, right? I like to live what I have now, you know, and, and if it's been given to me, it's for a reason and I want to make the most out of it. So whatever you're doing today, my message is just, you know, keep living, but fully. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be yeah. following your journey as, as I have been. I wish you the very, very best of luck. You've been an absolute gen and a privilege to be speaking to an interview. And I thank you very much for your time, Felipe. Likewise, Steve. It's been a pleasure, man. Till next right. time. God bless, sir. And hopefully next time I could do it in person, maybe in Brazil. Yes, maybe in Brazil. And who knows, you know, a couple of times that might be in the UK, we can meet up there and you, you will know the, the, the better spots in, uh, in the UK, I'm sure. Perfect. All right. God bless, sir. Enjoy. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Okay,